Good evening. Welcome to the Opportunity Coalition. My name is Brian Watson. I want to thank the Innovation Pavilion for allowing us to host the event here. I know I thank them every time, but if we didn't have them, we wouldn't have this space. Uh, I bought this building a number of years ago, and I did it mainly because of this tenant that's in here. And they are a business incubator, and lots of great companies are thriving and growing here. So we're, again, thankful for them. I want to also acknowledge Tony's Market. We have Lindsay Richardson. Lindsay, where are you? Come on up here a second, Lindsay. We're going to have you say something about Tony's Market. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I am Lindsay Richardson, and I'm with Tony Rosacci's Fine Catering. We are the full-service catering division for Tony's Market. And for those of you who are not familiar with our markets, we're a specialty food and meat market uh, local here in Denver, and we've got four locations. So our fine catering division can take care of anything from basic box lunches to fundraising events, weddings, company picnics, and uh, would love to chat with anybody if you have any upcoming needs uh, or if I can answer any questions. But at the very least, please enjoy, and I know you'll have a great evening. Thanks. So we have never had food donated before, so it's kind of exciting. Yours truly um, made all the food before, 24 hours before I was cooking for all of you. You didn't know that, did you? It's not true. You wouldn't have eaten it, probably. But again, we're thankful for that. You know, I just got a chance to do an Opportunity Coalition podcast with uh, Daniel Rosacci, uh, the person who's running Tony's now. And it's amazing to see uh, what that organization has done and the impact that they're having. So if you get a chance to, to listen to that, and it's a great, great market. I want to acknowledge our advisory board members. We have Millie Kitchen with uh, JP Morgan over there checking you in. We have Nicole Gamp sitting right here in the front. Kyle Henderson, who just introduced me with XL Companies. Sue Kenfield with See It Thrive. And did I miss anyone else? I've been too busy chatting. Okay, before I go into my talk, I'd like to have Millie come up with the business cards, if she could. If any, everybody put their business card in there? Okay, so what we do at this juncture is we will select a card. You will be invited to come up and speak about your organization for 20 to 30 seconds. If you don't, I'm gonna just kind of push you off the stage because we don't wanna go too long. So with that, Millie? Don't make it too hard. Okay, sorry. <laughs> now, if you don't want to come up and talk, give me the sign that you don't want to come talk. I don't want anybody getting up here and getting freaked out. Okay, so we have Bob Lewis with uh, Larson Engineering. Bob, come on up. My name's uh, Robert Lewis with Larson Engineering. Um, first, I'd like to thank Brian and Kyle for putting all of this together and having us here. Um, at Larson Engineering, we're a full service engineering firm. We do everything from MEP to civil structural engineering. We do lots of curtain wall. Our curtain wall is world renowned. We did the DIA Hotel, all the glass there. We did the World Trade Center that just was recently rebuilt. And uh, we're starting to make a presence here in Denver. We've uh, actually worked in this building. So uh, if you have any engineering needs, feel free to give us a call. Thanks. So now I have a disclaimer about Larson Engineering. So they're one of our tenants in a building that we own out on the west side. That whole thing wasn't rigged. There were multiple cards in there from other people. <laughs> Robert just happened to be the one that was picked. So I want to make sure we clear that up uh, without a doubt. A lot of people ask me, why did you find found the Opportunity Coalition? And I did so for a few primary reasons. The first is to promote free enterprise. I'm a big believer that's, that's one of the things that made America great. It continues to make us great, and we can never take it for granted. The second thing, the reason that I created it, is because I wanted to connect people together. Oftentimes, we all get into our own niches, and whether it be business or getting busy with life, and we don't have opportunity to go connect with others and to learn from them. And that is the third reason, is to come here and to hear from great speakers their golden nuggets of wisdom and to figure out how that may apply to your own life in making your business or whatever it might be even better. So we're grateful that you're here with us. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to talk about a concept that has really been germinating in me and I've been kind of taking this journey for a while and I know it's been occurring with a lot of you. And that is this idea of doing well by doing good. Think about that for a second. 
doing well by doing good. Sometimes in society today, people assume, oh, those business people, all they're <laughs> after is profit or money or getting more market share. They just care about themselves. But you see, I believe that there is a convergence where you can actually do well and make profit and grow your company or your business, whatever it might be, but you can also do it while you're doing good and to have a positive impact in society. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to read a book called Halftime. How many in here have read the book Halftime? So in this book, Halftime, a gentleman by the name of Bob Buford wrote it. He asked the question of when you get to the halftime of your life, what do you want that second half of your life to be? You see, a lot of people focus on this thing called success coming out of the gates. I mean, whatever that looks like for you, build a nonprofit, make money, get the house on the hill, whatever it is for you as you define success. But oftentimes, people need to make that transition of going from success to significance. What is the significance you're going to have in this world to hopefully make it a better place than you found it? I learned that this idea of halftime, none of us know when is that going to, when is that going to be uh, for us. Some of us may be in the third quarter right now. Some may be in the fourth quarter with a few seconds left on the clock. <laughs> Don't get up and leave right now. <laughs> we'll keep an eye on you. But I learned this the hard way. My stepfather, Bill Watson, who adopted me, and I consider him my father, uh, went away healthy one morning at 39 years of age. And he came back that night, and he died on the floor in front of me. 39 years of age. When Bill left that morning, he didn't think that he was at the halftime. He probably didn't think he was entering the second quarter, right? But that's what happened. And Bill and I, that morning, had a disagreement about something he asked me to do. And being that I was 16 at the time and had all the answers and was immortal, we had an argument. And I went off to basketball practice, and I felt guilty about it, so I bought him a t-shirt from my team. And I left that t-shirt on the table for him so that he would have that when he got back that night. That t-shirt was a symbol of, I'm sorry, forgive me. Sadly, I was woken at 10 o'clock that night and Bill was in the advanced stages of an asthma attack. I did everything I could to save him, but he died all the same. And he never got to see that t-shirt. He never got to hear I'm sorry. He never got to have someone make amends with him. So I share this with you not to be sullen or sad, but to encourage you that you never know when your halftime is in your life, and you never know when the fourth quarter is either. And to treat those people around you with love and respect, and even if you disagree with them, make sure that they know how you really feel about them, hopefully in a positive way, and work towards it. Life is short. It's okay to forgive. It's okay to love. This book also talked about this idea of taking your passions and turning it into your profession. You see, I really believe, and I know many of you have heard me say it before, that if you pursue your passions in life, the things that really drive you, and you apply that in your work life, you'll never work another day in your life because you're truly enjoying what you're doing. And so I encourage each of you to think about what it is that you're doing for a living, what it is that you're doing to help serve society, to show love, to have a positive impact. We all could probably do more. But take a moment and say, you know what? What do I want my legacy to be? When people think of you at the end of your days, what is your legacy? <coughs> my parents told me when I was young, Brian, you would be a blessed man if you could go out and impact one life for the better. Just one. And if you have the capacity to impact hundreds or thousands or millions, so be it. But focus on the one. And I think we all have someone right now maybe that we're thinking about, someone that we could go out and have a positive impact. It could be a family member, could be somebody at work, could be somebody in our community. Focus on the one and see what positive impact that we all can have together. 
The reason I picked that particular topic tonight is Susan Morris has been a friend for a number of years. She is one of those rare people, actually, that I would say, that truly lives life with passion every single day. And I just love that about her. She's going to make me look like I was asleep up here at the uh, microphone here in a minute, so I've got to build it up. But Susan uh, is really pursuing her passions, and she's made it her profession, and she's having a dramatic impact in the lives of many, many people. Susan is the chairman of Belize Natural Energy, which to date is the only oil producing company in Belize. It has become the number one revenue generator and helped transform the economy of the Central American country. <clears throat> Susan's passion for Belize and its people became ignited when she first met with Belizean Mike Usher, who shared her vision and desire to make a difference there. <clears throat> Usher and Morris both knew there was oil in Belize, but convincing others was their biggest challenge. Over the years, well-respected and world-renowned oil companies, some of the biggest, had dug 50 exploratory wells, 50, with no success. In fact, executives and colleagues in these companies advised Usher and Susan against the drilling attempt, which could negatively affect their careers. When have you come to a point in your career and your life where all the naysayers are out there and all the people saying no in the stands? And you knew that if you messed up, you might actually negatively affect your career, but you went forward anyway. And you're successful. Regardless if you hit a whale or not, you were successful in trying. Well, they hit a whale in a big way. Susan's values of trust, social and environmental responsibility, human potential, creativity, and teamwork complement the core objectives of B&E to find oil and extract it from the earth in a safe and environmentally professional approach. 99% of Susan's employees are Belizeans. She didn't go down there and find oil and bring a bunch of people from America or other places. She employed the very people that are there. And she's impacted the education and healthcare system in ways that many of us will never know. So with that, help me welcome Susan to the front. Thank you, Brian and Kyle. Um, that was such a, an amazing introduction, but also a very heartfelt opening uh, from you, Brian, to set the stage. I think to let us all think about, we don't want to have any regrets. We want to make the most of our lives and the most of our, our full potential. I think that's true for everybody, um, to really live life. And so, um, I don't even know where I should start today. <laughs> we had a lovely brainstorming session, and I think it's a great tradition, where the, I think it's the board of Opportunity Coalition get together for about half an hour before we come in here. And they fire lots of questions at you. I suppose it's to see if you can answer them. <laughs> start with your diapers. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it wasn't. It was knickers and a twist. <laughs> it's an Irish expression, uh, me meaning don't get all het up and worried. We say, don't get your knickers in a twist. Is that the one you meant? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't thought it was going to start that way. But uh, I was born in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And uh, I never would have thought that a wee Irish girl... There you go, Brad. <laughs> a wee Irish girl would end up making a, a really uh, significant difference in a country, in, in Belize. And um, I want to share my journey and the learning and building blocks because I believe that everybody can find out what their capacity, what their true passion, as Brian said, is, and follow that. And so, although I'm telling you a story about my life, I want to actually let you go home with knowing that you too can take these same steps and be all you can be, and follow that passion. I'm gonna to have to get my water. 
Um, well, I think, uh, you know, why did I become a geologist? I used to uh, run around the rocks of my geography teacher, as many of us know, we would be inspired by a teacher. And I thought, well, goodness gracious, can this clambering around rocks actually be a real job? <laughs> and I found out it was, and I went to Trinity, the university in Dublin. And uh, luckily enough, Trinity isn't an exacting science, because I'd been at an all-girls school, and the biggest science was domestic science, which is cooking. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a funny story to, to get me here, because now I'm a petroleum geologist, and that sounds like a scientist. But it's actually more about the art and the love and the passion of your, of your, of your life that you want to connect with. And so I don't even think un going to university is particularly necessary, unless you know that's part of your passion. Um, then I, I was hired by an American company, straight out of college, and brought to the United States. And I'd heard about you Americans, <laughs> <laughs> that you were all entrepreneurs. And it was the backbone of America, this entrepreneurial spirit. So I thought I'd better get on with it. And I set up S. Morrison Associates very, very quickly. Um, mainly because I, I really did believe and could feel 35 years ago a huge pioneering spirit here in America. To tell you the truth, I don't quite feel it the same way today. And we'll touch on that later. Um, I then got a phone call. And uh, it was a very proper English man. And he said, hello, Susan. Is there any oil down here? I said, well, Ian, where are you? And he said, oh, my God, I think I'm in, in British Honduras. But I think they've just changed their name. And it was 1981. And they had just gained independence. And they changed their name to Belize. And I don't know if any of you are in the oil business here, but there's a fantastic library out here. And so I nipped up to the library, we young geologists, and I, I don't really like computers, still don't, by the way. So I got one of those human librarians, I don't know if they're still around, human librarians. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, I told her what, what I wanted. And she said, you know, I've got this report that they've been working on for about 15 years, but it hasn't been published yet. And she said, it's all in handwritten notes with sketches. I said, that sounds great. So I got it. And I said to myself, if you go back 100 million years, and that's where geologists have a bit of an advantage, um, <laughs> you know, we could, we're time travelers. Uh, uh, you could see that those oil molecules didn't know there was a border between Mexico and Belize. <laughs> and so actually, Belize is the Mexican basin. So I thought, you know, they've got plenty, but it's not going to stop at the border. So I jumped on a plane and went down and joined Sir Ian Rankin. And when I got off the plane, and this was a key, key moment, I fell madly in love with the people and the place, Belize. The brown eyes, the trust, the connection with, with life, with everything, with each other, with the jungle, with the sky, with their heritage, uh, with their just open happiness, and I adored the place. And that motivation, that purpose, unbeknownst to me then, was part of, I think, a critical stirring. One of those things that maybe many of us as students felt, I really want to be part of changing the world, making a difference. But it's that type of stirring. Uh, anyway, Ian and I uh, explored and uh, for a couple of years, and I was back in Denver, where I live. I live about 10 minutes away from here, actually. Um, and someone said, you must meet this Belizean, Mike Usher. And we met, and we both had a desire to make a difference. He wanted to get home to his country, Belize, and I felt his country was the best thing since sliced bread, that's another Irish expression, the absolute best country. And uh, we decided there and then that we would find a way 
to find mm -hmm. out and not just in the let's say the ordinary way get in get out get the money and run mm -hmm. but to really make a difference for the people in a way that nobody had ever seen before we tried uh, in many, many different ways. We even drilled the deepest well offshore Central America with big major oil companies, Demonex, which is the German national oil company, Petrofina is the Belgian national oil company. And today, thank God, it was a dry hole because they didn't love Belize. They were wanting to get in and out and get the money. Um, now, meanwhile, I would come back to Denver and... Um, started a, 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 I say an idea. I'd been to a number of countries all around the world and I'd noticed opportunities. And I came back to the United States and it was on one of those downturns where the price of oil had plummeted and everybody was out of work. Geologists were bartenders. Um, I'm sure many of us remember that time. It was a, it was a recession basically. And I thought, goodness gracious, how can I get the world together so that there's a mixing and matching of these opportunities? And as life would have it, um, the president of the American Association of, of Petroleum Geologists, and this is 20 years ago to this month. They're celebrating this month back in Denver, the big AAPG convention. It's at the end of the month. But they asked me if I would be head of international. And I said, well, what does it do? And they said, well, we've never had one before. You make it up. <laughs> and uh, I said, wow, that's a good chance for me to have, to have a go at this idea. And so we got together a hundred volunteers and I painted the vision of the energy world coming to Denver in a CASVA format where each country had their, their booth, their minister was there, their geologists, their lawyers, their maps. I even suggested they bring some of their cool products like coffee from the Congo or chocolate from New Guinea uh, because I wanted it to be, to be different, you know, not just about maps. I wanted to really uh, let them express themselves. But it had never been done before. And I didn't realize in the background of the AAPG there was some negativity going on. But luckily enough, we were 100 strong and we were barreling ahead. And this thing happened 20 years ago. Um, 52 countries came. They're ministers of energy. And it has been replicated for the last 20 years throughout the world. And billions of barrels of oil have been found from taking action on one idea. And I was given a lovely uh, award for being a global visionary. But that's not the point. What happened after that was a key turning point in my life. A professor came up to me and said, Susan, would you come and teach what you did? You know, you had an idea and you, you did it. And I looked at the professor and I said, don't be daft. You just roll up your sleeves and do it. <laughs> and he looked at me as if I had snakes coming out of my head. <laughs> so I realized then that not everybody comes to the table with the same understanding. And although I knew and loved the rocks and the earth, I knew nothing about how humans worked. So. The scientist and businesswoman in me decided, this is a major gap in my life. I am going to find out the answer. And about the same time as I had started on my research throughout the world and throughout time, an older oil man, very famous one, called Wallace Pratt, coined a very famous phrase. And it was, oil is found in the minds of men. Well, I didn't like the man bit. <laughs> I think I knew what he meant. <laughs> um, uh, but that was further reinforcing that I did not understand what the key, the key to, let's just call it success at the business of living was. Why is somebody like Gandhi able to go out and make a huge diff difference in his country? Or Nelson Mandela? Or Richard Branson? And other people 
just wait or indeed can't even get out of bed in the morning. What is that? The, the, the mindset of a, of a super achiever. And how do I get to understand how we work? Because that was the gap. Because I couldn't tell this professor, I'll come and teach what I did. Because I didn't know. I didn't know how I did it. So uh, to cut a long story short, I researched all over the world and found a course that had all the research all the way back 2,000 years to Socrates, who said, know thyself. Plato had a, another go at it in a different format. And many people since, but what's happened? I researched in California, various books, but I needed someone who had taken a historic and a scientific approach, had got their own case histories, and then applied it practically, because I'm a really practical person. So I found a course, and to my surprise, because I was here in Denver at the time, it was started by an Irish man, Dr. Tony Quinn. And so I thought I will go along to it. I was, I think, the first person in America that went. It was 12 years ago. And I went to the course. And I just described, after about the third day, because you'll all identify with this. You know the way you have an inspirational book that Brian talked about? Or you'll go to an inspirational movie. Or indeed meet an inspirational person. But there's gaps between those events. What happened on the course in a very structured, clear way so that I could apply it was the coming together and understanding of all of those in a eureka moment. And it was 13 days. As soon as I had understood that structure within myself, how the mindsets of growing up, now I grew up in Belfast, so one of the big mindsets is, is it a green god or is it an orange god? <laughs> well, I couldn't quite get with that one. Uh, so I thought, well, there must be something behind those colors. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would say that sort of fundamental understanding uh, is a key part of the spirit that we're talking about. Um, anyway, within a month after completing the course, I went straight to Belize. Remember that first love? I wanted to make a difference with Mike. And I told Mike about the course. We set up Belize Natural Energy. And within two years, I believe it was, maybe two, three years, we had actually discovered, as Brian said, the very first oil in Belize against all odds. But remember, it wasn't just the president of Shell and BP and Mobile who said, Susan, for heaven's sake, stop talking about Belize. You know, you're ruining your reputation. Um, the first line of attack for any of your ideas is your own doubt. You have an idea, and then you say, well, look, I'm a wee girl from Belize. Why should I do it? I mean, from Belfast, why should I be able to do a thing like that? So that's the first line of attack, and that's something that you need to understand how to say no, because that's not the spirit of us. That's, that's part of your past, part of the old mindsets, the baggage, as we might say, that we're carrying along in different ways. You want to set it down and live, because you don't know how long. We don't know if we're halfway through, as you said. We want to really live with that spirit. Um, then, of course, nobody else would come into this wildcat drilling. And so 76 small Irish investors who'd all done the same course joined us. They'd never heard of Belize. They thought a wildcat, and a wildcat is a high-risk oil well, they thought a wildcat was a jaguar. <laughs> it's probably just as well they didn't really know. <laughs> because in wildcat drilling, it takes 10 to 15 wells before you hit. And we only had enough money for two wells. Talk about faith, trust, belief. 
that vision that I had learned how to hold, how to create and see that vision, and a phrase comes to my mind, without vision we perish. We're lost in our own doubts, or in somebody else's bombardment of doubts. Either one, you want to be able to see that vision clearly and describe it to everybody so that everybody <coughs> is in alignment. And that's the key. That's why I got the shivers, it must be. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, it was amazing. It was like all the birthdays coming together when we hit the oil. And the Prime Minister, wasn't the Prime Minister you just met, by the way. It was the uh, earlier Prime Minister. Um, I love that coincidence, by the way. There's two people here in this room that I don't even know that were on my jetty last week in Belize. <laughs> and she even looks like my sister. <laughs> it, it's just, it's, a, it's one of those lovely things that are lineups in life that we want to take advantage of. Um, anyway, Belize Natural Energy discovered the first oil, celebrated, but Mike, my darling partner, Mike Usher had died before we drilled the well. Mm. But I was even more determined to go on, you know. And we discovered the oil so light they could put it in their generators without refining. They still do. But we've discovered so much. Shell, who didn't believe anything, is buying it all. <laughs> anyway, uh, this next point, when I went to the president of Shell, was the, the, the point that he admitted to getting goosebumps. Because Mike had died on the 24th of June, 2004. And we discovered the first oil in Belize on the 24th of June, 2005. He was a young man. He died of a burst hernia. He shouldn't have died. He's been with us. All the oil wells were on the Mike Usher number 22. And I was joking with the group who hit the board earlier. If I say it quickly, my gusher, my gusher, my gusher, it sounds like my gusher. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, people think I'm a show off. But uh, <laughs> when something is aligned from the very essence of our self, the life, well then, you can show off about that, because everybody's part of it. We now have 200 Belizeans working with us. All of them are trained in all the facets of oil and gas, exploration, uh, production, uh, transportation, marketing, fire and safety. We've won awards all over the world for fire and safety. We're the only oil company that I think even dared enter for the Green Award, and we won it. Uh, and then we won a very prestigious global award called the Get Energy, and we beat Saudi Aramco. We changed the paradigm shift from how many barrels have you got, or how much money have you made, to do you make a difference in the country? Mm. And what do you do? Isn't that what Brian was talking about? Mm. And that's where it's at. That is where the fun is. That's where life is. That's what makes the difference to all of us. It's huge. And if you go away with something, it's knowing that inside you and dying to get it and go forth with it, with your own passion, for your children, for your families, for your communities, for your country, for the world. About a year after I did the course, the seminar, my cousin came to visit me from Africa. He's actually originally from Ireland. His name is Josh Stewart. And some of you may have heard him talk here about three months ago, was it, Brian? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was a young pilot. And I'm telling you this story because it's awfully important to be able to replicate a new business model we set up this new business model in Belize. Now, can it be replicated in another country and in another industry? This is 
the answer, a big yes. Josh came along and he um, stood on either leg and said, you know, Susan, everybody thinks I'm so great. I'm a pilot dropping parcels for the United Nations all over Africa. But I just know, I'm, I, I don't feel fulfilled. And I said, well, rather than go and see if you can get a job with United or Continental or whatever, as lots of us do when we don't know what to do, we just try another job. Uh, I said to him, look, I've just done this course and I have a sense in me, it was amazing. Because um, our vision is that we really are going to find, we haven't found the world yet, we really are going to find the first world and believe and, and actually be famous for it. And he sort of looked at me wide-eyed. Uh, but I said, look, what you really want to do is get to know yourself, the essence of yourself, to ask these questions about what really is your journey, where is your passion, what is your destiny, your road. And he said, oh, okay. And he went along to this same course. And today, in fact, I was there all day today, XJet, the number one private aviation company throughout the Americas for two years in a row and spreading to Dubai, London, Paris, Morocco, Saudi. That whole vision was born on that same seminar. It's a holistic business model. And he's a dir director in my company, in Belize Natural Energy, and I'm a director in his company, XJet. Now, what's coming from that is, uh, <laughs> and Nadine, I just saw you, uh, because you're reminding me, is Josh is now living in Dubai and setting up XJet in Dubai, Saudi, London's already done, Paris, and Morocco. He's, he's probably just about getting up in Casablanca right now. <laughs> I'm not sure of the time zone, but it's pro pro maybe the middle of the night. Uh, anyway, he applied this and took off like a rocket. Now, he had opposition out there at Centennial because the old paradigms were a different type <laughs> of private jet model. He shifted the whole decision making, everything to the owner. And has actually, I don't know, by the way, before I forget, you're all, if you haven't been to X yet, you are all invited. And we have an open house on the second Wednesday, the 10th <laughs> of June, in X yet at six o'clock. And it is a fantastic facility. Two huge hangars with all the private jets in them and a state-of-the-art seven-star service for not only training and bringing XJet angels, and I'm looking at one who's training from Dubai right now in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it's the core, the prototype of XJet around the world. Now where that's led to, if, you, if you're already so excited you can't imagine anything more, we we'll hear this next bit. Our vision together with Josh and I, has now taken an expanded version. And we dared to think that the Emirates, who are the, second, the ninth largest producers in the whole world of oil, that they would look at and understand what, what we had produced, both in XJet and BNE. And this all came through a relationship that Josh had with a gentleman called Ali. And relationships are incredibly important. But what happened then was Ali and Josh became friends. Ali came down to Belize. He was totally amazed at the Belize B&E model, at the XJet model, at the replication of the model, which was holistic. It really makes a difference in a country. And so he spoke to his minister of energy, the royal family in, in the Emirates. The Emirates were born on a vision. Abu Dhabi discovered oil 44 years ago. And instead of going, oh, 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 you know, I'm going to keep this, like many people do, 
they reached out, that sheikh reached out to all the poor Bedouin people who had no money and said, look, we can put together a country that this region has never seen in thanks to Allah, to God, for having brought this oil forth. And the seven countries of the Emirates came together in this invincible vision. Now, they have been trying to understand the building blocks, teach it. And now in walks Josh, who has learned the building blocks on this course, and then me. So what they did was they invited us to bring a public-private partnership from Belize, BNE, the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Finance, all went over as the, as the guests of the royal family in the Emirates. This was about six weeks ago. And we are now getting ready and prepared for the Emirates to come to Belize. Our expanded vision is that Belize is the total energy solution throughout the Caribbean and Central America. It's strategically placed. Their vision is to be the leader in the understanding and this holistic model throughout the region of the Middle East. And literally, there is like a, a, a golden arch, just one of the, you know, the McDonald's, just one of those big arches, literally across from the Dubai region, the Emirates region, right through to Belize. And we are preparing everything. Because what they're doing is they're going to be looking at the infrastructure, the roads, the ports, the energy, and everything. And it's an energy exchange because they want to be able to train their people in our model and come together across the globe in this understanding that we're all talking about. The very thing that Brian really threw out to everybody. Can we, can we not just have business over there and philanthropy over here? Can we do it all together holistically in our lives? Not only can we, whole countries can do it. And it's very exciting. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, I think that, that's it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> questions to the crowd, I'll ask you a couple of questions. So currently we're going through a dip in oil prices. There's about 10,000 people employed in the oil industry in Colorado alone, and that may is already impacting office space and industrial space, etc. What are your thoughts on the price of oil and where it may be going? The price of oil goes up and down, like the price of sugar or the price of anything. Um, and the key is to train your people to be all they can be. And what happens in the company is that there's diversification in areas where you least expect it. We've done the obvious things that got into electricity and propane butane, but education, micro lending, everything. So don't just rely on the asset, which in this case is the oil, and therefore you're up and down with the price. Go for the potential, which is the total opened potential of your people, in your companies, in your countries. So there's some people out there that believe that we will run out of oil uh, in the near future. And there's other people who say things like fracking have revolutionized uh, the oil industry and energy production. What are your thoughts in response to them? <coughs> it's a bit like the answer to the last question. Uh, the innovation and the energy, the real energy business, we're all in it because it's the energy within ourselves. It's the energy we feel tonight. And when we realize that, you don't have to be at the whims and the, and the, the blowing of the wind because that creativity that brought the Wright brothers, brought flight, that uh, that capacity to have those invincible visions is within all of us. Connect with it, go with it, find out about it. And you won't even really need to ask yourself questions like this. 
<laughs> I just sit at home and ask myself questions like that. <laughs> so you've accomplished much in your lifetime. What would you like your legacy to be? Wow. It's a light question. It's kind of uh, <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, well, I, I think both Josh and I feel very uh, compelled to be able to pass on how we have found that success, that happiness holistically in our families, in our children, in our companies, in our communities, and in our country. And that connection with life. And so I would like this for the world. I'd like to see a, a world like that. Let's open it up to the group. Questions? Cliff? Um, this is another hard question. I apologize. With the tragic uh, death of Sir Barry Bowen uh, about five years ago in a plane crash, that left a, a void of epic proportions in leadership in the country. And I uh, was a fly fisherman and a diver and a traveler and a lover of belly and beer, obviously. I, Good taste. I felt at least a small amount of that loss because I share the, the, the passion for those people that you do just a little bit. And they need leaders, and they can do a lot down there. And I was wondering, what have you had success in trying to expand your philanthropic model and your business model to include the larger community beyond the oil business? Specifically, what have you been able to do, and how, how is that going, filling that, that huge space? So to repeat the question, with the tragic death of Sir Barry Bowen, there's been a void of leadership in the country. And what uh, may Susan and her group be doing to help uh, fill that void? Uh, firstly, I knew Barry very well, um, and uh, he gave me uh, key advice right at the very beginning before he'd actually fulfilled one of his dreams, which was to have a hotel called Chan Chich in the middle of a Mayan plaza in the middle of the Belize jungle. Um, and Barry said, he said, whatever you do, do it really well. <laughs> he didn't use the term seven star. But he did tell me how he got such great beer. He said he went to Heineken and he poached the best brewmaster. <laughs> Tempted them down to Belize, that's right. And he did it. And his shrimp farm, he get, got the German, the Wurzilla electrical generation. Uh, he is he's, uh, really missed. But I would answer, the real leadership is from within. It's actually that essence of us which when you strip back the layers, is that knowing, that integrity, that goodness. And when we lead from that, we understand that we don't have to carry and don't worry about whether um, uh, someone is manipulating or conniving. There is a genuine sense of leadership and direction from a whole society and that's that's happening in belize um and it is amazing to see so for those in business coach the best brewmaster that's the <laughs> <story>. <laughs> Bill. yeah i'd like to ask a question when you did your wild catting what geology told you to drill where you drilled there were 50 wells that were dry you went offshore that was dry was it intuition? Was it luck? Was it geology? So the question is, for those that couldn't hear, is that what was the intuition or what was it that drove you to drill where you did when so many had failed before you? It was all of the above. But as any businessman will tell you, um, and I can speak from the oil business here, there's a leap of faith. And that leap of faith was guided by connecting with this deeper essence of myself. In, we could call it, in a scientific terms, the unconscious within ourselves, which is the area that is, uh, is imprinted, or even that God part in us. That's the key. That's what put X marks the spot on the map. Yes, Kim. Uh, Kim Munson, and one of the ha uh, hats that I wear, I'm on the Douglas County Energy Coalition. 
So could you comment about regulation in the oil and gas industry? So Kim Munson is not only serving in that capacity, but she also has a great show called AmeriChicks. And so it's a radio show on Sunday afternoons. Give a chance to listen to it. And so the question is, comment on regulation, which is a pretty big <laughs> subject. But you should try to think about that one. No, I don't need time. Okay, good. I'll just give you a suggestion. Um, adding one other bit. Imagine that. And I'm not into regulations. Um, before we discovered the oil, I wanted to find a way to, to, to bring public-private partnerships together in alignment, because alignment is key to success. Um, you know, everybody being on the same page. And so what I said was, a royalty stream, that's the first stream of revenue from an oil well, should not only go to the government, but it should go to a trust. And the trust is a committee with government, could be county councils or whatever it is, uh, and b &E together. And that is slated for education and the environment. I've spoken to John Hicken, the, the governor, because he's a geologist too, about it. And it's a model that actually um, is very directly about the people and bringing forward and training this entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. which, you know, sometimes regulations can stifle the entrepreneurial spirit a wee bit, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, but I would say that might be a good one because it creates alignment and a togetherness in making a difference from the ground up in any community. In the most recent article I read, there's about $400 million that has been contributed to the government. Is that yeah. correct? I yeah. have the right number. So it's a substantial amount that has gone to the government of Belize due to Susan and her company's actions. Somebody else? Next question? Nicole. Susan, I know you're um, just how you overcome everything. Um, getting personal and very specific, what um, is probably your biggest fear or doubt or failure that you ever had? Obviously, you're going to explain how you overcame it, but <laughs> what was one of your biggest fears or failures? So Nicole's not going to be invited back next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a good question. Give me time to think about it. So the question is, what is your biggest fear or thing that you had to deal with in your life? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's actually a fascinating question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, because that's what holds us back. Mm -hmm. Same thing as the doubts. Doubts, fears. Are, we're riddled with the darn things. The trouble is we don't realize it. It's not in our education. And so that key course I did 12 years ago, and I'm going to tell you a little story, and it's a very personal story. Um, and my daughter would probably kill me if she was here. Um, she was 18, and she took me around the side of the house. And she said, I need to speak to you very quietly. And she said, I'm pregnant, and the boy wants nothing to do with me. And my old conservative fears of what the neighbors think or what we're going to do or all of that, they felt like torpedoes heading towards me. And thank God I had done that seminar because I knew to say, be present, be so present. These are not me. These things are stuff from the past. Be present with Hannah. And I could feel her little cautious happiness, her tiny smile. And in that moment, I hugged her. And my little granddaughter was two last week. Be present. I love it. Anyone else? OK. Well, with each speaker, I like to share the golden nuggets of wisdom, at least that I heard. And there were many from you tonight. You might laugh at some of them. I don't know. I won't say I'm as good as you. Number one, don't get your knickers in a twist. <laughs> I'm unsure what a knicker is. Is that my underwear? Is that something longer? But I know not to get it in a twist. If I ever have those. I heard about you Americans. This entrepreneurial spirit was the backbone of America. I'm going to skip down to one that she said before because it ties into the other ones. Oil is found in the minds of people. I put people there, <laughs> not men. So if the oil is found in the minds of people, 
Susan also said that billions of barrels have been found by taking action on one idea. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Tied into that, oil does not stop at an arbitrary border. It's true, isn't it? Yes. And it can even go beyond our minds. I fell madly in love with the people and the place. How many of you are working in an industry or a place that you're madly in love with the people? <laughs> Now, if that's in your workplace, you may have some issues with the employee handbook, I don't know. But the idea is love and respect the people that you get to associate with. I really want to be part of changing the world, of making a difference. Love that one. Don't be daft. You just roll up your sleeves and do it. I don't think I've ever used the word daft. I like that word. <laughs> your first line of attack is your own doubt. You need to understand how to say no, set it down, and live. That one's worth reading again. Your first line of attack is your own doubt. You need to understand how to say no, Set it down and live. It's a good one to take away. Let's give Susan a round of applause. So next month, on June 25th, one of our advisory board members, Sue Kenfield, has a company called See It Thrive. She's going to hold a panel regarding entrepreneurship. If you're an entrepreneur, there's something you can learn. If you've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, there's definitely something you can learn through that panel. <laughs> On Thursday, August 20th, we have uh, the Honorable Bill Hibble. He's the Chairman and CEO of the El Pomar Foundation. He was also head of the U.S. Olympic Committee and has done a whole lot of things beyond that. And then we just got confirmation from former Congressman Bob Schaefer for the September 24th event. He's the principal of Liberty Common High School. If you don't know about Liberty, it's a charter school in Colorado, and it is now rated the top charter school in the entire state. They're doing some very special things there, and their statistics are proving it out. So again, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you next time.